Welcome to the story of liberty. This is your host, John Bona. You know, there are great monuments in America. In America's hometown, Plymouth, Massachusetts, there is a specific monument erected in memory of the pilgrims, Plymouth's founders. I hope that as we walk through the forefathers monument here for a little bit that it'll restore your faith in God and you'll see the courage that these people had their desire to preserve liberty and to see their sacrifice and their resolve to train their children these people saw themselves created for a specific purpose God had placed them upon the world stage to accomplish certain tasks. Christ actually led them to do monumental things. They had this view because they looked at themselves as a new link being forged in the chain of liberty. On that tiny Mayflower ship as it was tossed by the storms on the Atlantic Ocean. The Forefathers Monument all begins with faith. She's the main central figure, and she is pointing to heaven holding a Bible with the pages being blown open by the wind. The pilgrims actually bought the Geneva Bible with them on the Mayflower ship, and they read the Bible daily and had prayers. It shows clearly that they had faith in God. It was the core of their liberty. They believed in the Word of God. Our forefathers believed that Christian liberty preceded civil liberty. They knew that the Christian liberty was internal faith and morality, and that the second was external. Christian liberty gave rise to civil liberty in society quite different than what people think today, but the pilgrims would have desired a, an America based upon Christianity as the source of its laws. We will note that the Forefathers Monument is shown in its time, which took over a hundred years to build and was finished in 1889 on August 1st. And it begins with faith and then moves to morality, then law, then the figure education, and then finally liberty in that order. Hammett Billings, the designer of this monument, he understood the pilgrim belief that internal Christian liberty is best expressed by faith and morality. And then external liberty is best expressed by the law education, and liberty in that order. These four key symbols on the statute of faith uh, that Mr. Billings designed were used to interpret the pilgrim belief. In other words, these four symbols defined a forefather in general and a pilgrim belief. The open Bible faith is holding depicts the pages being blown open by the wind. The Geneva Bible was used by the pilgrims and it was studied daily. And on the Mayflower, they brought the Geneva Bible with them. The pilgrims believed that the Bible was the infallible word of God and it was the only source and standard for their lives, their personal lives, their lives with others and how they were to live and treat people, as well as governing their families, their churches and societies. You'll notice her raised forefinger is pointing to heaven. This was the 
pilgrim belief that there was only one way to the Father and heaven, and that was through Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son. In other words, there was only one mediator between God and man, and that was Christ the Lord. There was no need to pray through a priest or somebody else. One could have direct contact through prayer with God and have relationship through him, with him, through Christ the Lord. This belief defined the Reformation. It caused much division in the church, but this was based upon scripture. We see the star on faith's forehead. A star represents honor and importance. It depicted the high place that the intellect had among the pilgrims and their families. They knew that the mind was a special gift from God. Although it fell short to sin, it could be guided by and directed by the Word of God, applying the truths of the Bible to all situations in life. In other words, the Bible had answers to the problems in life that we all have, could be reasoned from the Holy Scriptures in a logical manner. And this was one of the reasons that the families that were in Leiden, Holland for about 11, 12 years decided to leave there. They were concerned about their children, and we'll discuss this more in the symbol of education. Morality is the first seated figure. She's female, too. She's looking inward. She doesn't have any eyes. Uh, and Hammond Buildings designed the statue that way because she's looking inward. She's holding the Ten Commandments to show how a person is to live. She's also holding the scroll of the book of Revelation. It shows the rise of ungodliness in the world, too. The collar of morality symbolizes that each Christian was a priest before God. These are the two internal liberties, faith and morality, we need before we have external liberty in our laws, education, and political, economic, and religious liberties. The Ten Commandments that she's holding shows our relationship to God in the first four commandments and our relationship to man in the last six. The pilgrims had a great desire to obey God and all the commandments. They knew they fell short. They were imperfect. But they knew that the commandments need to be thought of and prayed about daily. Hammett Billings, when he designed morality, he took a look at several other murals that he had painted and he came to the conclusion that the symbolization of morality really defined the pilgrims because they were separatists, because they separated from the established church that they saw was sinful and fell short. They formed their own churches by a voluntary covenant. And this covenant was established at Scrooby Manor in 1606. Next to morality is the prophet under the left side of morality's chair. It shows that they believed they heard from God to leave England, go to Holland, and then eventually to the shores of America. You can note that the prophet is looking toward heaven receiving a message from God. Under the right side of morality is the statute of an evangelist. 
So the Pilgrims had a desire to be a better foundation for a future society by first exercising their religion and morality, attempting to be an example to others. The evangelist is taking seed from the Bible and throwing it on the ground. It's a common symbol for the preaching of God's word during that time. The pilgrims, as you might know the story from the movie Monumental, they attempted to leave England many times. They were betrayed and spent time in prison. And after a shipwreck in 1608, they made it to Holland. They spent a year in Amsterdam and 11 in Leiden. And their congregation grew to almost 300 people. But they left Holland for the New World because they were very concerned mostly about their children. Their children were being influenced by the culture. It's also interesting to note that morality, the statue, was paid for by the state legislature of Massachusetts. Isn't that great that they actually believed back then they should be public servants and to be a clear example of morality. Next, we come to the statue of law. He is male, and he has these very powerful eyes that kind of pierce right through you when you look at him. The pilgrims believed that all were equal before the law, including the king. They knew that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Many of their laws came right from the Bible and the Ten Commandments. They were good and proper laws. A great man, G.K. Chesterton, said, We have to choose either the Ten Commandments, laws, or the Ten Thousand Commandments, Ten Thousand Laws. Someone said the fact that there are so many criminal laws across the land that the odds of not breaking one in a lifetime are so astronomical that it would make DNA odds look like simple math. It's interesting, the Bible teaches that the nation's monetary policy is tied to the concept of justice, just weights and measures, as seen on our monument and clearly taught in the law of God. Inflation, in fact, easily perverted paper money, is called the treasure of wickedness in the book of Micah. While this statue of law has one hand extended toward the victim in mercy, while the other hand holds the statute laws of the culture, this was a very good balance to show that ethics and proper restitution was given for wrongdoing. The punishment fit the crime. Well, they practiced these laws properly and it was done with equity. We see here the little scale relief of justice enacting the due process of law as the Bible describes with two or three witnesses requiring before a death penalty, for example. The depiction of the scales of justice indicates the proper practice of law and equity. It actually came from the common law of England although it was very mistreated by the kings who had run them out. We also see the Statue of Mercy, and this would show, among other things, that even when people did them wrong, or hurt them, or caused mischief, they would show mercy, just like God shows mercy to us when we fall short. 
The statue of law was put in place and paid for, for the most part, by a group of Connecticut lawyers. The lawyers back then understood the pilgrim ideas of law and government, and they seen a link between the founding of their own state in Connecticut, known as the Constitution State. You know, the fundamental Constitution of 1639 in Connecticut, it does construct a bicameral legislature. In fact, Noah Webster suggested that the United States Constitution be similar to that of Connecticut. It was Mr. Roger Sherman from Connecticut that broke the deadlock at the convention to adopt a bicameral legislature in the United States Constitution. There is also a carved out quote next to law, the one small candle quote that says, thus out of small beginnings, greater things have been produced by his hand that made all things from nothing and gives being to all things that are. And as one small candle may light a thousand, so the light here kindled had shone unto many. Yea, in some sort to our whole nation, let the glorious name of Jehovah have all the praise. These were William Bradford's comments on the year 1630. Also, it's very interesting that this panel faces west, just as faith faces east from where the pilgrims came from England. This quote faces westward in the direction of an expanding nation. It was this faith in God that brought the pilgrims all the way from Leiden, Holland to Plymouth, Massachusetts. And they knew in their hearts that this small beginning would eventually make an entire nation. That's amazing. Their beliefs and respect to a representative government, a free enterprise system, God-given rights protected by the government, the right to own private property and start a business. This freedom, these liberties, would expand across the nation. William Bradford could be given much credit for his work as the governor of the Pilgrim Colony. He knew that this seed, their beginning, although seemingly small at the time, would have a great impact in the future. The small statue underneath the left side of education called Youth it shows the fact that the pilgrims had great concern for their children's welfare and the fact that they were being polluted by the culture. Here we see a mother leading her child, taking her by the hand, taking responsibility to train the child, to preserve both innocence as well as purity. Boy, how we have lost innocence in our youth and the culture today. I just wonder how many young people we have in America that still are innocent. So many of our young children at young ages, they just know too much of the bad things that are in the world and innocence is lost. The next small statue underneath education is wisdom, the grandfather. This wisdom of a grandparent of experience and age, it depicted here as a means of leading the youth. You know, once leaving England and their agricultural lifestyle, and then learning new trades in Holland, caused them to wonder if 
time was actually working against them. They wanted to practice their faith and they were concerned and here wisdom showed them to take the challenge and sail to a new land. Next, we see the Mayflower Compact, the great document of 1620. It was written right on board the Mayflower ship there in the harbor. And it really shows the beginning of self-government constitutional law in the United States. You know, having been blown off course, they needed a document to bring unity and remove any dissension. So they wrote their own, and Essence was a, an expansion of what their agreement was in Scrooby at the church. A model of voluntarily associating through a, a covenant accountability became a reality in the civil government they were now forming. This document would mark the development, the beginning of an American government, and its theological roots were set in the historic Reformation of Europe. We should note here how the document starts in the name of God, Amen. We see the order of giving proper allegiance and glory begins with God and then to one's country. This became the example for other documents written up in the various colonies, even including the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Next is the Liberty Man, shown on this National Treasure of the Forefathers Monument. He is obviously the most strongest of all the statutes. His armor predicts the spiritual battle, or Christian battle, I may say, for Christian liberty and civil liberty that the book of Ephesians in the Bible describes as one's defense in this world of good and evil. It's interesting that this liberty man, he's preparing like an athlete. He's not adhering to his diet and intense training for the fun of it, to be a nice guy. Christ told us to make the nations my disciples. He didn't give us an exercise in futility, but a command to be fulfilled. It just has to be done his way, as shown on the Forefathers Monument, from the bottom up through transformation of the heart, not forced down from the top, forced submission by a tyrant or a government. This ideal man, this liberty man, is not only seen here on the Forefathers Monument, but we have seen him throughout time. And of course, this includes women. We see the problem, we repent, and by God's strength, liberate millions by Christ's example and his sacrifice. Take a walk with me through time as each of the few of David and Goliath short stories show the battle between good and evil, liberty and tyranny. And against all odds, the liberty man has stood against these tyrants. It's the same song, a different verse. In each of the fallen, we will see the same pattern emerging. First, the tyrants rise up they steal as much wealth and power as they can through deception and lies, and then the liberty man rescues and liberates. Tyrants are representatives of the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy in the book of John 10.10. 10. But the liberty man is a representative of Christ who comes to give life and give life abundantly as shown in the same verse of Scripture. Tyrants, they promise benefits but deliver crushing taxes, confiscation of property, laws without justice, and then the persecution of true believers eventually follows. But the contrasting sons of God, the liberty men, burst forth because of the truth of God's word is revealed in them. 
and they stand for liberty, even when faced with persecution or death. Of course, it all begins with the triune God, the Word of God, and their plan to liberate planet Earth. Then Moses steps across the threshold of history. This liberty man of Israel and founder of the Hebrew Republic brings to people the Ten Commandments. Christ the Lord, the God-man, the one who made the stars as scintillating lanterns in the sky, the author of liberty himself who rose from the grave, the liberator and only savior of the world, the living word, the day spring on high, the creator of the liberty man. He was enthroned to rule the earth until his enemies would be made his footstool. The day will come. Not long after his resurrection, the gospel was preached to the whole known world and Christian nations began to rise. Folks, I just dropped by to help you understand, yes, that Jesus is Lord. Centuries pass, and then a new liberty man comes on the scene, Patrick of Ireland, the English missionary who peacefully civilized the Emerald Isle. He was the first person in history to eliminate slavery in a nation. He brought order using handwritten Bible passages. But tyranny rose up, and the cruel Vikings ravaged Europe and almost destroyed Christianity from the 8th to the 10th centuries. But the Liberty Man, Alfred the Great, he saved England from the cruel Vikings. He fought 54 hand-to-hand -hand battles. He unites England under common law and the Ten Commandments. But then tyranny rose up and King John terrorized England, plunging the people into wars, poverty, and even starvation. He created huge taxes. He burdened the people heavily. But then the Liberty Man, Stephen Langdon, and the people of England in 1215 wrote the Magna Carta. They codified, they wrote down the rule of law over the king. This Christian document, this Liberty document, the Magna Carta, is the inspiration for our own Constitution. But tyranny rose up. King James wanted control of all of life. He killed or exiled all those who stood for liberty. And he ignored all the freedom documents. But then the liberty men and women, the pilgrims, they stood against these tyrants as they obeyed the word of God. They started their own home church. And for this, they were forced to choose death, imprisonment, or exile. But by their peaceful example, and documents like the Mayflower Compact, they set the stage for America's freedom. Their governor, William Bradford, established a free enterprise system in the Plymouth Colony, and he decided to assign every family a parcel of land to cultivate on their own, and all worked. And this concept of free enterprise, it initiated a new era. Tyranny rose up, and King George III began to terrorize the colonies in America through illegal power grabs, taxes, and stealing property. But the Liberty Men, the Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, and other men such as Samuel Adams, Patrick Henry, George Washington, and an army of believers stood firm against tyranny. They fought a defensive war to protect their wives and their children. But tyranny rose up again, did not go away, and the tyrants of the evil empire, the USSR, they threatened world destruction during the Cold War. They confiscated all property. They killed millions of their own people and enslaved one-third of the world's population. But the Liberty Man, Ronald Reagan, against all odds, was the point man in peacefully dismantling the evil empire. Ronald Reagan stated, Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We do not pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our grandchildren what it was once like in the United States of America where people were free. And that's why this message from the Forefathers Monument is so important. 
Our Liberty Man is the symbol of this transforming monumental strategy unleashed through the ages to liberate the nations. Apostle Paul said it all, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Our Liberty Man rests in the providence of God and over time he defeats or his children defeat the enemies through faith, intelligent action, a loving character, and charity. He is the real man. If he has to fight, he will, but there is no other warrior to compare him with because he already knows what no other warrior knows. The victory has been won. This spiritual battle the Liberty Man is in exists from now on until the Lord's return. There is no ceasefire. There's no temporary truce. There's no cessation of hostilities. The Liberty Man, the Liberty Woman need to be constantly strengthened by the Lord. More precisely, folks, by His mighty power. It is in the power of His might. The Liberty Man and Woman is to fight this battle with the strength that is not our own. Please do not miss this. Christians, just as we are justified by our righteousness, which is not our own, we are to fight the good fight of faith with the power that is not our own, the power and might of Christ the Lord. This Liberty Man is free in his heart because he is constantly cleansed and filled by Christ his Savior. He bows before the morality of Scripture and he realizes the roots of the American Republic were planted on these eternal principles of truth, justice, and the sovereignty of God. He uses these laws planted at Mount Sinai as the foundation for true civil government and personal liberty. He applies these laws to create just institutions that protect the innocent among us. He prioritizes his life to educate his family to tell them of the mighty deeds of God because he sees a responsibility to pass this truth on to the next generation. The Liberty Man is the man. He has this calm assurance because he has within, inside of him, the power and might of the King of Kings. And that is the same man, the Liberty Man, that will save America today. Where is he? He's in the hearts of men and women who are fully devoted to God and his law. Recognize your connection. You are the Liberty men and women. It's not Rambo or the Terminator or Wonder Woman coming to save you. God has placed you on the stage of the world this day to do your job well. How do we do that? Well, it happens in you. And you and you, a self-governing person under God's law, then to your family, your church, into your cities and towns. People, we can improve America because people made it what it is and we can make it what it ought to be. Christians believe that. And let me finish with what Apostle Paul said. I could do all things through Christ. Amen.